Savon Springer is the owner and founder of Native Assets. Any views expressed by Savon or his guests are their own thoughts and opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Native Assets or the guest's respective employer. Any guest appearance by representatives of Web3, NFT, crypto, or any other kind of organization does not constitute an endorsement by Native Assets or the guest's respective employer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be mistaken as financial advice. Always conduct your own due diligence and consult a qualified professional when considering any investments of any kind. Great day, great day, great folks. Thanks for being here, checking in for another episode of Native Assets. And today, we're back in the creative bag, right? We, we've had some technical guests, but the technicals, the creative, you really need both sides of the equation to get things done. And the gentleman sitting right here before me, you've definitely seen his work. You may have seen it on OpenSea. You may have seen it on the cover of Time Magazine. You could have seen it all number of places. But today we have Dirk Vandermeer, the world builder and art director for Aku World. Dirk, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm doing really well. It's, uh, it's a beautiful day today. Yes, yeah. And it, it looks like you're somewhere warm, man. Yeah, actually, I live in uh, Curaçao. Uh, do you know where it is? Is that in Brazil? No, you know, it's, it's clo- close. It's kind of, it's off the coast of Venezuela. It's a neighboring uh, island of uh, Aruba. So it's in the, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, nice. So yeah, I've been living here now officially for two years. Been coming here a little longer. Uh, my girlfriend lived here. So, uh, it was, mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, I had to move, which, uh, which was a good deal for me. Nice. Nice. What's probably your favorite part other than your lovely partner? Uh, what's what's your favorite part about the area? Well, I mean, it's like it's really. I mean, it's Truckle Island. It's like what's <laughs> what's what's not to love. Yeah. But for me, I don't really go out in the, the full sun like during the day. Then I'm usually just uh, <laughs> like in the house behind my yeah. computer working. Uh, but I really love the evenings where it's just like in the summertime. Uh, it but that's of course here always. It just stays nice and warm, and and you can just. Uh, those, those warm warm evenings, uh, I really appreciate uh, appreciate those. Heck yeah, heck yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing those warm island vibes uh, for the show today. If you could, Dirk, just set the people up, let them know a little bit about your background, how you got involved into the NFT space, and then what it means to be an art director for the Aku World Project. Right. Well, I kind of sip through this. Um, I went to art school when I was 20, 21 took a lot of years for me to realize that computer uh, would be an interesting medium for me. It was like already like 29, 30 when I started making digital art, started out in architectural visualization um, where I learned a lot, but I felt and wanted to do more creative stuff. So over the years, slowly got more into level building kind of for games, for VR, uh, environment building, but also kind of a 3D generalist doing some character art, also like concept art. Um, yeah, just kind of like doing everything that I thought was interesting. Um, you know, freelancing in that and then kind of fast forward to the end of, I think, mid 2020 through Twitter. I got introduced to uh, crypto art, as we used to call it back then, yeah. which we would now call NFTs. Um, and yeah, I got connected to a, a really cool group of digital artists, people that until that point had only been able to make money in educate or in, in entertainment, movies, and, and, and games and stuff like that. But now we're able to sell their art actually as standalone art. So there, there was a great like uh, vibe in that group. And I met a lot of cool people there. Uh, one of those people was uh, Micah Johnson, Micah Johnson, former Major League Baseball player that um, was doing a series of paintings. I'll just quickly explain what he what he did, making a series of paintings where he was painting young black kids wearing astronaut, astronaut helmets. Um, anyway, he wanted to create a little character named Aku, and he needed a 3D artist for that. So that was me. And uh, together we basically made the, the that first the first parts of uh, of Aku what turned out to be ten chapters of NFTs, um, yeah, and that it was it was very successful and and yeah we're still going very strong. It's a uh, uh, it's a great team. Team obviously grew uh, <laughs> uh, after that. 
uh, success hit us. Um, and I'm the art director for that project. But one thing I did really want to manage from the from the start, because I heard, heard a lot of stories about artists being at the start of a certain project, then it blowing up, and then you evolve into a role like something like art direction. Uh, but it's very tricky that you don't, that you're not making art anymore yourself at that point. You know, you start to be, be in the business of people management. You know, I don't necessarily want to be in that business. I like to make stuff that mm -hmm. will never change. So Mike, it gave me a lot of freedom in kind of creating my own role there where I'm still um, like if there's a really cool opportunities and I, I and I feel I'm the right man for the job, then I'll really get in there and, and make stuff for myself. But uh, we got a big team of super talented individuals. Um, and, and most of the stuff we do now is all collaborative in a, on a much bigger scale. Um, but that's that collaborative. That's really the operative word here. The difference between the NFT space and like the client work before this really is that this feels much more like a collaboration mm. than working for somebody. Um, uh, so, yeah, but that's that's in short kind of my involvement with the Aku Dreams project and, and how I started working with Micah uh, Johnson. Thank you for that context and that background. And did you, did it take you, and we'll focus more in on, on the Aku project in a moment, but I imagine even before 2020, you probably heard about NFTs or maybe we're kind of just watching it from the side. Uh, what was that process like the couple of years, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019? Did you know a lot of people who were getting into the space and you yourself just didn't really, you know, understand why you should pour your time there? Or, or how was that early day? Well, I was like, like, I think my first getting introduced into to NFTs, I think it was like somewhere in... Uh, 2020, which was fairly mm. fairly late at that point, um, but it did click for me right away because I remember, like years before, I'd had this discussion with a friend where we were thinking about, like, why is it so hard for digital artists to actually sell their work? Mm. Just instead, uh, like, forget about like doing prints or making art books or, or, or stuff like that, or creating posters or, or whatever merch of your work, but just actually sell it as standalone art. And remember, we talked about the blockchain. Obviously, not in the context of like that would create this huge market. You know, that, mm -hmm. I think nobody really saw that uh, coming. But the technology and, and the uh, I'd always felt that there's enormous talent in digital artists. Like I knew people that were really good uh, at all different kinds of things, but they use a computer. So you wouldn't really see them in a museum, bottom mm. line. You know, mm. unless it was some fringe uh, digital exposition yeah. uh, or like some exposition about the art in games. Um, it was still very separated worlds and, and people had gotten so much better. So when NFT suddenly hit, there was, and look, there's a lot of not great art out there, but that's uh -huh. a kind of part of the beauty, like the non-gatekeeping part of it. But so many super talented artists uh, now are emerging because of uh, NFTs. And uh, that part it will always be the part that I, I think I like most about mm -hmm. NFTs, like the empowering of the, of the artist. But there are obviously many more sides to uh, the whole business uh, currently. Mm -hmm. Have you, since joining in in 2020, now you've been in for a few years, you're part of one of the most successful projects in the entire ecosystem. What would you say has changed more than anything as far as your view goes on this space? Maybe something that you didn't realize early on and all these benefits, you know, that, that you just spoke about. Well, are there any things in particular that are, that are a lot different now that you've gone through and you've worked on a project and kind of seen a lot of the insides and outs that come with it being an NFT project and not just being digital art? I mean... For me, it's really, um, I, I can think one of the things that I realized is, so this was really the opportunity for me to start making my own work. Mm. You do client work before, and now you can do your own work. Um, and a lot of other artists are discovering that. They, they, they used to do client work, but they got this, this passion for their personal projects, and now they can actually take that much further, spend all their time on that. 
I actually realized that I fare very well working in a project, working with other people, like the creative problem solving, where somebody says, I need a, a character and it has to be, these are the parameters, or mm -hmm. I want to build a world and this is what it looks like. Um, so that creative problem solving really worked much better for me in a way, although I still hope in a, in a couple of years I can do like my own, uh, uh, like the, the, the Dirk work. But for now, that's been very scattered and like all over the place. So it really focuses me to have a client and to have a project and to know like who we are making this for. So I guess that I learned that about myself is this the mm. biggest takeaway from, from uh, NFTs. In general, I'm not really, I'm a creative. So I'm not that much like up to speed with all the latest technology and stuff uh -huh. like that. I may hear Micah talking about it all the time and, and Roger Dickerman, who's the head of Web3, but also heads the Artifacts project, the, the other project that I'm involved in. Uh, you know, they're way deeper in this stuff and I, I love to learn from them. But I've uh, decided early on, like my job is to make art and I, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that and do that as best as I can. And, and also not listen too much to the to the noise because every now and then I'll step into a Twitter thread and think I'm adding <laughs> some positive information and it's, it's a nuclear bomb <laughs> that, that goes up. That's uh, so I try to yeah steer away from that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful with Twitter, man. People can come and it can be a mob of joy. It can be a mob of terror. Just uh, it depends, uh, you know, where the sun is sitting that day. But yeah, my, yeah, it's it's an exercise that I do to like actively not respond to certain things which is mm. a skill that you're like yeah. you read something you have a comment in your mind and you do nothing you let it go uh but it's, it's important yeah that's very zen very stark uh so from the the creative concepting standpoint micah did some drawings or some paintings beforehand y'all linked up talked about it what was that process like uh, how much referencing did he already have in mind with the rest of the world? And, and how did you kind of take that, that idea that he had, those concepts, and then really breathe life into it? Because I want us to go a bit deeper because the visual aesthetic, what y'all chose to do with Aiku is very different than a lot of the other projects that you see in the space, especially when, you know, Bored Apes kicked off. And then it was like everybody was just doing 2D, you know, generative, a lot of very saturated, loud colors and often with a bunch of damn animals. So there were a lot of little areas of that that y'all didn't go down and, and, and found yourself landing with something that I think stands out a lot from most of what's in the crowd. So can you walk us through what that process was like? Yeah, so Micah had done this little uh, little sketch, which actually I was trying to look up the other day and I couldn't find it, but we have it mm -hmm. somewhere. It's a, it's a very simple sketch, but he kind of sketched out the character. Um, then I turned it into 3D and I just made some choices. And what we immediately discovered that we have, we are on a lot of things. We are, we have like synchronicity. We're on the same page. Like I, I chose a simple, like the primary color palette for Aku, where it's the yellow backpack, blue pants, and then the red heart, and then the t-shirt is white. That's mm -hmm. very, very clear, readable. Uh, and it's exactly what he had in mind. Uh, which I don't, I don't think we had even discussed that, but, but uh, things like that make it very easy to kind of iterate with, uh, with Micah. So just made some renderings and then adjust some things. Um, you discover some things, for example, like if a, if a young kid would actually wear an astronaut helmet on uh, realistic size, it would go over his shoulder, you know? Mm -hmm. So you need to find a visual balance where it still looks like a cool character, but uh, you know, you to stretch reality a little bit there. And I think, um, immediately Micah wanted to do 3D because he understood that he could do paintings and drawings, but 3D will, will take your character into, yeah, the metaverse. So if you want to do AR filters or you want to do, have a horizon where you want to do games um, or, you know, whatever, then, then 3D will be the medium. So to immediately have that aesthetic kind of be grounded in 3D, um, is then yeah that was kind of just a logical choice and also for myself um because you know there are many w different ways to render animations but i've been using game engines for a long time so like unity unreal mm -hmm. basically software you use to make real-time 3d you make you make games but i i use them for animation because they're so much quicker you can have mm -hmm. a real-time feedback on your lighting on, on all these things so 
That's what we started using right away. So even those first chapters, even though they're they're like videos and like pre-rendered videos, they were all they all come from game engines. So we were able to work super fast with that. And um, yeah, game engines is everything we do now. If, for example, is inside of Unreal. So even if we do, um, let's say, a mock-up for an event, we need a, like a three D like storyboard or something. We will do that inside uh, the game engine. So we really breathe and think in in three D. Um, and yeah, then the people that got, got attracted to the project afterwards were already in that mindset. And then mm-hmm. that that 3D mindset really becomes uh, a fixture in, in uh, for Aku. And it seems like from all the different projects that I follow, the ones that are trying to stay compatible with different mediums, not just be, you know, the artwork itself, but say, all right, if we needed to make a I animated film with this. If we wanted to put this in some sort of gaming environment, Unreal seems to be that that choice. And also, a lot of people who are building out digital avatars and virtual influencers all seem to be doing uh, using Unreal. Several years ago, when you started using it, did you think that it would ever get so prominent to this point where it's like, I feel that, you know, nine out of 10 projects you point to, if it's something with 3D art, they're using Unreal uh, or they're going to have to transition to that. And do you think that? Um, all of this feedback from the NFT community kind of leaning over to this tool, have you seen it influence the way that Epic has built or made changes to the tool at all? Well, I think they were already, especially Tim Sweeney, already understood that the power of Web3 and kind of the power of the technology, and they had already proven that they can build the metaverse, you know, with the the, the concerts and the events in inside of Fortnite, um, you know, they already uh, uh, kind of understood what you what you need to do, and people see that. And I think for a game engine like Unity, like their big competitor, it was much was much less clear what how they saw the future. At least mm. that that was my perception, and I think uh, Unreal was. Well, for example, like when I was in architectural visualization, I already knew about the Unreal Engine, the, the version it was back then, because I saw people render. Uh, there was a guy named Kulala, I think that was his YouTube name, and he got, got went viral with some Unreal footage that looked super realistic. At least if you look now, you see it's not. Uh-huh. But back then, it, it blew our minds. And all us 3D artists at that time were rendering frames. That means that you're creating an animation with thousands of frames. Every frame takes like four to five minutes to render. Oh, hell. And so you let it run for two nights and then you get back and then you realize you made all the chairs bright pink and then yeah. light bounces off and it's totally unusable. I like, like super frustrating and very intensive workflow. So we already saw, or at least I saw then like, Game engines is where it's at when it comes to animation and like uh, a full blown, uh, especially, you know, if you want to iterate quickly and you want to be able to have a scene, it's already done, it's animated, but now let's take five minutes and turn this into a night scene. Mm. You can do that, you know? Uh, So that was already super powerful. And then, um, like virtual worlds, uh, I got into like, when I started to work in, in VR, I made this uh, 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 virtual space called Maranga that I worked on for like three years, just in in in, uh, uh, in my own hours. Um, that was a unity, but that was just because most people that I could work with knew that it was a mm. different community. Um, but yeah, I think I could have never connected it to NFTs or like that web three technology. Cause I, I didn't like know, knew, I didn't knew about that. I didn't understand it. Um, but that is, a, a, it's a powerful piece of software. Yeah. I, I, I think I've been like boring people with thir- for over 13 years with, uh, talking about, uh, how, yeah, how, how that, that software is going to change everything. And it's already doing that. There are a lot of special effects that's going on that people don't even know are built in real-time render engines. Sometimes custom engines, but Unreal Engine gets used a lot. If you uh, Do you know the series The Mandalorian from like the Star Wars yes. universe? Mm-hmm. They use all their backgrounds. Uh, they use the Unreal Engine. 
that's all real time lit and they, they use some like a uh, custom version of it but basically the architecture is the is the unreal engine and uh, they really get to uh, um, enjoy all the benefits of like iterating quickly and being able to just like try things out and uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, real time. I mean, if you get me started on it, I I won't uh, I won't stop. No, no, no. I think it's good because I'm I'm I've never created anything like a 3D design or anything like that, any sort of animation. But I used to be super into games when I was younger. Like I was running back and forth to GameStop to you know do the buy three, get one on the used, and trade joints in. And I'm like six, seven years old doing this. So I've for a long time, followed the progression of the, the hardware, the, the graphical processing, and, you know, like Crisis. For some reason, I thought I could buy that game and run it on a Dell laptop because I didn't <laughs> understand, you know, the, the video card. I just saw how dope it looked. I was like, why would anybody not have this game? But I think you kind of showing, you know, how much you know about it, how long you've been on it is good for anybody who may not already be using the engine and is maybe holding out for some reason, might typically be because they have already built the skill set up using some other tool and they're like, all right, well, this works for what I'm doing, but they're maybe not realizing everything I'm seeing. There's this massive tipping point where it's like most things are going to be built using Unreal. And unless the government steps in and says, hey, like there has to be something other than this one tool because then they can, you know, they control the whole market. I just don't see why somebody wouldn't use Unreal at this point from my, you know, outside looking in perspective. So, Yeah, no, for sure. it's. Uh... Uh, and it's not just like I just mentioned some like really practical and like cost effective reasons why you would want to switch to Unreal Engine in in, in 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 things like animation, but it's also I think the, the primary reason that I started building it or, or started like working in it was that I was doing these renderings of these houses, you know, and they were static still. Sometimes I did animation, as I just explained. That was that was a huge hassle. And I was always like longing for like, I wish I could just like walk through this environment. Just to, like to see I should walk through this building. And then um and then in early days I was really looking hard for like solutions. But then Unreal Engine back then, and I think I even looked at it earlier, it was so rough. It was so hard mm. to get into if you're not a developer, you know, if you're just an artist and you don't know programming. It was so abstract and the inter interface was not inviting at all. And we've come such a long way. Now you can basically, you know, the, 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 the skins uh, around it, the user interface is so much more appealing. Um, so whenever I hear somebody say, yeah, I'm too old to like to get in on real or I've built up my whole skill set somewhere else. I'm like, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You're like, you can dive in at a point where you don't need have to deal with all those like uh, uh, headaches uh, you used to deal with. Headaches you were you used to deal with. You, and that's what I tell young people. I mean, you should be really lucky. You can just like, <laughs> you want to build a world for this thing. You download the SDK. You can just use your own mm. engine. You can put it online. You don't even have to. You know, if you now you want to build a virtual world or you want to build a game, you can use a platform like VR Chat or um, or Roblox or something. You know, you don't e even have to. Um, you know, and that's where your traffic comes from. The, uh, be on their servers. You don't have to pay for the bandwidth and 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 a lot of those things. It's just like it's become so much easier for creatives to uh, to get into the world of yeah. I mean, gaming. I don't. Gaming is too restricted uh, a term, but but yeah, mm. yeah, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. So, uh, shifting a bit back over to some of the, the the art related to these projects, and it doesn't just have to be Aku. But had you done any generative collections before you got into, involved with Aku and Artifact? Yeah, I actually got um, before I met Mike. I must have been. I'm not even sure, five or six months before, I have to look it up. Um, I applied for Super Rare, mm. uh, which was a site that I, uh, that I really liked. I thought it really looked good, had, had a kind of a museum quality to it. It was a kind of a slick design. Uh, they got admitted. And so I started posting some work there. Um, and I was already thinking like... Um, like, what's going to be my thing? Because, you know, you got to be like like... 
you can't really be all over the place. So like, mm-hmm. I, I was like, what kind of specific niche? Well, what's the thing that I really like to do? And then I already decided there that although most of the art was stills or, or video, I was going to do real-time 3D objects. So you can go on Super Eye, you can find my work. They're like these 3D GLBs. Um, you know, you can rotate them and, and now you'll have virtual galleries where you can place them as, as sculptures. Uh, you could use them in AR. And I think I was fairly early with, certainly not the first, but I think one of the earlier NFT artists that, that made quality uh, 3D GLBs. Um, so I think, yeah, that was really what I did. Um, I kind of stopped when Aku Dreams started taking off and I also took on the other project artifacts um, just because of bandwidth. Um, so I hadn't really done too much uh, uh, crypto art or NFTs after that personal work. I mean. mm-hmm. And what was the process like for you to have to go through? Because the thing with the 2D art strikes me as simpler to create a generative collection because the way the layering works, it's um, a lot of the things involved in it are more static than you might find with the 3D work. And so did you notice there being any sort of learning curve to how to really nail the generative aspect of a 3D collection versus what had up to this point, most of the tools that I've come across and seen people reference were all really optimized for 2D art. So what right. was that process like? Yeah, so my own work was all one of one. So that was not additions or anything. But when we did the Akuta project for, for Aku, then we did run into those problems you're describing, where we created 15,000 different Akutars, all with different outfits. Um, I mean, I'm, I would never say one thing is easier than the other thing, because like the 2D will, um, of course, you have much more control over what you see, but, you know, it comes with its own set of set mm-hmm. of problems. Uh, for the three D part, we really just created um, like a heat map. So you have your base Akutar, mm-hmm. and you make you make sure you have uh, every every region is a different region, and we call them region. So R five, R six, R seven, the head, the hand, the upper body, like maybe some jewelry uh, around the neck. The background, there were a bunch of those uh, uh, different regions, and you really kind of draw out a certain map, a certain like border where they shouldn't go over and they shouldn't overlap. Um, to a certain extent, it just becomes kind of like a, a 3D heat map because there's also like depth. You know, if you put a mm-hmm. surfboard behind somebody that also has the backpack, you know, and it's yeah. going to intersect. Um, so we we had some really good engineers like working on that, and the sort of three artists were trying to make everything within those restrictions. Then there were still some assets that didn't work, and we created like a collision matrix. So there was this matrix where we knew some things just don't work with each other, but we don't want to compromise because those assets just look cool. So that just means that this asset will never exist when this asset exists, mm-hmm. and then you uh, enter that also into the code. Um, and it was beautiful to see how they made this code where you just put in some traits uh, or you just let the computer run and it would do, 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 do. It would create all these avatars. But it's not, you know, you're not done there because then uh, you <laughs> generatively created all these avatars. You still want to go in with, uh, uh, and we all did, like uh, at the end of that, that You have row. to curate through them, right? Yeah, exactly. You have to, you have to curate and you have to be like, you know, fairly quickly and, and so there were days <laughs> that one we ain't were, it <laughs> yeah you know, we were there were days we were all just looking at akutars and <laughs> and uh there was first this round where it's like just go for buck hunting like if you see a mistake something that's just not good <laughs> um that's easier but then obviously yeah you just want to make sure it uh it all looks good and it's difficult i mean because there are so many different ideas and and everything is being combined you know some mm-hmm. things will gel much better visually than other yeah. things. But this is also where you create like those happy accidents. So every now and then somebody posts an Akutar which just has the right color palette. That mm-hmm. was not necessarily intended, but it just like looks super clean. Um, so that's that's fun. But uh, yeah, that, w- that was a challenge. But we had a really good team uh, of people uh, thinking that through. Mm. Now, I was thinking about the 
the visa accelerator program that you all were accepted into and trying to think to myself about in what ways that changed your role and empowered you in a way that that was different than, than prior to being entered into that. Because typically, you know, when people enter into different accelerators, you get some degree of um, counsel or advising from somebody in the space. Uh, but then a lot of times, too, you get more resources to be able to execute. So in your role, did you see that translate as having a larger team, which meant that you could start to either go through certain tasks faster or start to explore more things at one time? How were you able to leverage that program to level up your art direction? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say anything like directly uh, uh, connected to that, just because we have like, there's so much opportunity coming our way. There's so much stuff also that doesn't happen and um, that I'm really not that aware of. You know, I, mm. I still have the, the kind of privilege that because I started with Mike, I have like direct communications uh, with him. And I really get to sit on the on the art side. Uh, obviously, there he and now uh, Summer Summer Watson, um, who's part of the company, you know, have to make decisions that make uh, sense business wise. Um, but but yeah, you get to just like if, if something is needed for something, then we. We need we need that you know it's if you know some things are very expensive to do yourself but but if the if it you know it justifies the end goal will uh, will make it work so that's always been the mentality so I've never really been able to like connect it directly to oh we were mm -hmm. part of this and then that jump to that um, because I'm just so focused like, on the creative or, part of yeah things. fortunate to did not have to think about that or think about like. Because at a certain point, a lot of people want to do a partnership with you, but you can't say yes to everybody. You have to be selective. And I'm the worst person. Because if you come <laughs> with me with a great idea, then I'm really, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I want to do yeah. that. That sounds great. But uh, no, you have to be more uh, methodical. So usually when it gets to me, it's already been signed off. And there's uh, yeah. like, we know where the money is coming from for that uh, that thing. And we'll, we'll know the scope. Um, so yeah, that's... It's much as much info on that as I can give you, I think. I imagine there's a pretty big difference feel wise with the work that you do with Aku versus Artifact. Are you also an, uh, a creative director, art director at Artifact? Yeah. You want yeah, it's interesting. And there is a bit of symmetry there uh, because also that project, I uh, basically, Roger has founded the project and I was the first person to kind of collab with him and, and get really? that started. He, uh, the, the basic idea of artifacts is that we have uh, sell um, one of ones, uh, 2D one of ones, could be videos of well-known NFT artists, and then they come with a 3D. And the, the 3Ds are editions of 100. Um, so that is either an element from that painting or it's kind of a 3D translation. And there are very many different ways, kind of more of an artistic approach there. And I make those uh, 3Ds. Um, so, and now Roger later also came to work for the Aqua project as the head of Web3. So we were much, very much connected in that sense. Um, the difference is that with Aqua, we're building an IP, we're building a character, and we really want to know uh, what the audience likes. You know, we want to we, we work with people to, to make this thing better. And I think for artifacts, it's more really about the art side of NFTs. You know, it's really more about honoring that specific artist. So if we have an artist there uh, that makes a piece for us, um, then I'm not thinking of the public. I'm thinking of this mm. artist and like, what's, what's the best way to honor his style or her style and turn it into a 3D object that will then look good in whatever ways you can, you're going to use it in your virtual gallery and your <coughs> AR in the future many more different ways. And um, obviously like that real time, that, that GLB, that's the real time 3D object has some serious limitations uh, mm. because it has to be displayed on a, in a browser basically. Mm. Um, so the information I said, can be updated. Yeah, and I have to like be very creative with how I can still make it look good. Um, 
but it's not, I don't have all the fancy tricks that I have when I'm using Unreal. So it's a, it's a very different challenge, but I really learned a lot because I've been working with uh, so many different NFT artists with so many different styles on that end. I had to like really shift gears many, many times. Um, so yeah, I think that those, in, in that sense, those, those projects are, are, are very different, but I, I really like that they're very different muscles I get to use for both of them. Yeah. So it's like with the two and you get the full body workout. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the IP component of Aku, right? That was one of the things that drew me most to the project was really seeing, okay, this isn't just like, okay, we're going to do this drop. Then we might do some airdrops down the road and then, you know, mm, we're going to see. We're really thinking for the long term. And I imagine that there was a, uh, that may have been more new for you. Whereas a lot of the work you, you, you did prior, and, and I could be wrong, obviously, but what was the shift you had to make when before you may have been working on more so projects which like, hey, I'm doing this project. This might last, you know, a year. This might last two years, whatever it is. But ultimately I have a, you know, a scope. I deliver to the scope and I'm done with the project versus when now every decision that you're making, you have to think, okay, this may not, this trait or the way that this looks, the way that this feels has to endure and has implications on anything else that we bring in the world and how we need to style that. And all right, if we have the necks a little bit elongated versus the shoulders, then we now have to carry that aesthetic through to the rest of the world or bend certain things. How has that helped you grow as an artist when having to take more of this holistic long-term approach and re remember that this is going to bend itself to different mediums at different points in time? Great question. Yeah, I think that what I really learned or, or more like realized is how hard it is to create a character that everybody loves. Like, it's kind of lightning in a bottle. It almost feels like Mike I kind of stumbled up on Aku. <laughs> and he's the kind of guy that like, yeah, I think this is what he looks like. And, you know, we're calling him Aku. And, you know, he doesn't need to like, uh, uh, think about it too long just comes with him like oh that's a good name and then and then he makes a decision here and then oh, let's do this um and that the fact that we get to work with a character that's already proven its likability like people connect to the story uh people understand it has a lot of uh, potential uh that's great I, I now realize much better like how valuable that is it's like virality like big studios or companies try to create virality but you can't it mm -hmm. exists. It's, and if it exists, if it like it happens, you have to seize the opportunity. But you, you can't force it. And I feel Aku is really like that. So in that sense, it was really the, the gratitude I felt. The other part is very um, where I think we need to think about things differently than Disney does it, for example. Like we've done a lot of stuff with Aku where, uh, especially in the chapters, it, the, the chapters kind of started out kind of artsy, kind of poetic visual mm -hmm. vignettes. Um, then at a certain point, we started like getting more into story. Uh, but then we also had a discussion, Mike and me were like, the series will come, the movie will come. Is this the place where we were already want to do that? You know, because the danger is exactly as you mentioned, you paint yourself into some kind of corner and then you feel super restricted. And then you try to, create a story to, to tie everything together yeah. and find crawl your way out of this hole you've dug for yourself. <laughs> so I told Michael, we need to stay kind of free and light with it. That means that we can try out stuff. We don't, we're not legally bound to anything, you know, <laughs> yeah, very true. we got to not feel like that's a whole creative weight because then you stop having fun and it stops being fresh. So the, the mindset was always like, Let's try things and try them quickly and then test them out with the uh, uh, audience. Because one big difference with the Aqua project and, and the old school projects I was doing is that it took forever. I actually did some artwork for an animation that took like three years to come out. I mm. can't put it in my portfolio. I can't really <laughs> share any images. I have no idea what the public thinks of it. And it's two years later. I'm already done with that style. I, yeah. you know, I've, it's no longer I've relevant. Better. No, it's like you've lost momentum. So keeping momentum has always been crucial for, um, for Aku. And I really like to refer to those first 10 chapters as kind of dream phase, where it's more like concept art. We've, we've done visuals and some things we were really cool. Other things we were a little maybe shaky and we were not 
certain about, um, and that's okay. You know, in the end, you want, and you know, that's all being done behind the scenes now, obviously, but it takes a lot of time to write uh, the larger universe for Aku, write the larger story. But I always said, like, feel free to let anything go. If it doesn't fit the story, if it doesn't make, you know, people need to, you know, the story needs to resonate. People need to connect with the with the core of the message. Um, a lot of the other stuff, like what do cars look like on the alien planet he gets yeah. to visit or whatever, it's not that it's not that important. And I think that for for big studios, they're much more, they feel much more pressured that they. And it's why artists can't like share concepts on, until like after the movie's been out. A lot of artists are under NDA. We don't. We just share stuff because we want to see like um, what it does. Um, so there's, I mean, like for every artistic project, it's the it's the the balance between having focus and not having too much focus. Mm. You know, if you're too focused, you make music. You might. Recognize oh, yeah, yeah. that's a tough one. Thing, <laughs> you, you, it slips out of your hand, and you, mm-hmm. you, it's not fresh Becomes anymore. Becomes too mechanical. Yeah, it starts to be forced. Exactly, but then still, you have to finish it. You know, yeah. you still have to have the poster. <laughs> so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a delicate thing. But um, we know this is a long term project. Everybody involved knows it's, it's a long term project. We're we're doing something very new. The, the core thing is exists like an IP, a character, but the way we are doing it is very new. The way the company is structured is, is very new. Um, so yeah, we are we are figuring it out, but we're doing it in the uh, in the eye of the of the public and and yeah. And that's a great experience. Last creative question and then uh, we can wrap up with just a few rapid fire, just get your thoughts on the broader ecosystem and I'll let you get back to your day. One of the key things to connecting to a character usually are the eyes. Aku has no eyes, no mouth. How the hell do you make a character that feels human, you feel the emotion, but you can't use the two tools that most allow you to do that? Yeah, I love that question. We we've been talking about taking off the helmet like from <laughs> like the first two chapters. And the more we talked about it, the more we, we realized like Micah was like, that helmet's not coming off, at least for a long, long time. Um because yeah, that is like common knowledge, like to like the eyes are the mirror of the soul. Like to connect with somebody, you have to like to trust them, you have to look into their eyes. But I I remember this thing where I saw some children of a friend of mine looking at some animated series. And the main characters were like stick figures. They looked so simple. They were just faces with black dots for eyes. And I was like, how is it possible that in a time of Pixar, when it's perfectly animated and then realistic, or at least beautifully stylized Mm -hmm. characters with 3D and, and all the effects you have, this is still something that kids like. And I think it has to do with projection. You you project something in the character that you see in it in a way because Aku doesn't have a face. And also, maybe even more importantly, we've never heard him speak. Mm. You know, we, we don't... He's very mystical. He's very kind of open. And, and that allows for a lot of interpretation and a, and a lot of projection. Now... How do you deal with that when you do turn it into a movie and do turn it into a character? You know, does it mean that in the last chapter he does take off the helmet and are people then going to be disappointed to be like, oh, I, I thought, <laughs> thought he was going to look a little different. <laughs> yeah. You know, these are, these are all uh, things that I'm not going to say we've, uh, we've figured them out. But yeah, what, what you just described is just also one of the things that, that we learned. And I think somehow Micah intuitively knew starting this um because we were making I, I do remember when we were making the first version i did ask him like do you want the visor to be transparent uh so we see a little bit of a face 
And I think he was pretty uh, convicted, uh, had a strong conviction from the start to be like, no, it has to be fully reflective. And then the reflection itself gets, you know, you can play around with that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of lot of fun stuff you get to do uh, um, because you actually can see what's reflected in his helmet. So you can you can play it, and we, we've played around with that as well. So yeah, and that's one of those things that you can't really like focus group this. And be yeah. like, because nobody would say, oh, yeah, that's a great A-B, idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's never see the kid. But then when it organically exists and it connects and it resonates, then, uh, yeah, as you, as you said, like like when you're making art like that, uh, that if you're not a little bit less focused and then these things can just kind of mm-hmm. pop into existence. It's, it's hard to really explain it. But. Yeah, no, y'all got something special in. The way you describe that projection is is beautiful. Uh, you know, I have a background in psychology, and by removing the eyes, the mouth, it also kind of invites people in because, like, you're even more curious to know what is there, and so yeah. it pulls you in a way that is not the same if it's you know something that you're used to seeing or characteristics that is whatever you have your own perception about what those characteristics mean or the association. Same with like voice tonality. And um exactly because if if you do a face, any face, it will immediately, you know, one of the things humans are programmed to do is make a judgment call. Yeah. You know, for better or for worse. Like we see somebody and we have a have a have an idea. That's um we, we put that person into a category and and then hopefully Aku is now in his own little category. Um but yeah, the psychology is interesting. Yeah. So if you uh, could point to anything, and it doesn't even have to be NFT related, but just in the broader Web3 web landscape, what, other than Aku artifacts, what is drawing your focus and your attention in the Web3 space? Well, I think there's a big disconnect, and I talked a little bit about this earlier, between like we've been hearing the, the word metaverse for a long yeah. time. And uh, a lot of people that are being critical are like, yeah, but it's not really a revenue model there. Like the daily visitors of these big, like on-chain mm-hmm. metaverses that they're, these are very ridiculously low numbers. And I always say that that's not where you should look. You should look at what Fortnite has been doing. Like, uh, th- those those events they've been given and just gaming in general and realize gaming is not just gaming gaming mm-hmm. these days is not just about like shooting it's a lot about relationship building and that's the a part of the stickiness for a lot of these games it's why people return because they make relationships inside of these games a lot of an- another feature of a lot of successful games and platforms these days is building people love to create mm-hmm. they don't learn the 3d program but they know that the the mod system for that game or the uh, the the Fortnite customizer or whatever whatever it is and they spend hours and some people get really good and make make beautiful things like even Minecraft so there's enormous creativity there it just hasn't connected to the NFT world and there's still a lot of NFT hate uh, uh, like out there a lot of people don't really understand what the technology could mean but I think as I mentioned, like Epic understands that you could bring those two things together. Sometimes you have to do it silently. The way kind of Reddit now has been using NFTs in for their avatars. Um, and, you know, they call it digital collectible. So you just do some rebranding here and there. And um, But I do think that those worlds are going to get together. And as I mentioned, I built some virtual worlds that I put on VR chat. Um, and that it's very, yeah, man, I've done some of those little tours where like 15 people, we go world hopping. Mm-hmm. So we just start somewhere, somebody drops a portal and we visit different worlds and the, the different artists are part of the tour. Not a lot of people get to experience that because you need a VR headset and also mm-hmm. it needs to be tethered to a PC because it's fairly heavy. So it's a very niche, but it's, um, I had some great adventure and I met some great people through that. Uh, space um but yeah that needs to get connected to that that other crowd and that'll be uh 
that's going to be a slow burn. I mean, that the, the, that real metaverse dream is uh, it's going to be years and years for the yeah for good solutions to to arrive. I think. I'm personally of the opinion that Epic, like this, could be one of their end games. You know, no pun intended. But um, the way that I've seen them. You know, just the, the the way that the tool in and of itself, Unreal Engine, is embedded in the ecosystem at this point and starting to see different studios and players come out who are basically betting everything on Unreal Engine and trying to build everything in such a way that they can import other projects in on their behalf to speed up the development time and connect these worlds together. And to your point, not everybody's thinking about it. There aren't a ton of people thinking about it. But the people who are thinking about it, I think are pretty damn hard about it. And, uh, you know, we see what, what is already happening with Fortnite and the what's a possible there, but also some of the limitations that can get fixed. Pulling in some of these technologies, I imagine within the next five, I think the next five years, we're going to look and be like, damn, that right there is, is probably the closest thing that we have. But um, it remains to be seen. And, and I, I'll definitely be keeping an eye on it. Dirk, any last words for you? Let the people know how they can get in contact with you and we get out of here. If you want to find some of my work, you can just Google Dirk at work and you'll find my Twitter and, and website and uh, all of that stuff. This, uh, it's been a great talking to you, man. Thanks. Thank you so much, man. This was awesome. This was lovely. And uh, I look forward to doing it again sometime. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Right. You take care. Bye-bye. Get your skeleton around the map See, I terrorize like it's getting more Cause I theorize at higher tempo But you been on in my mode, though I'm a red dime and a get more